Good afternoon, my dear friends. Uh, I have been given a responsibility to, to talk on something which is a very, very difficult philosophy of life. Uh, day in and day out, we are, you know, in the middle of, uh, of our life in day-to-day -day activities, we are always perplexed with the kind of uh, solution, what is right, what is wrong, you know. Throughout our life, we are always, you know, submerged into this kind of dilemma, what is right, what is wrong, what I should have done, what I should not have done. I think I think this is one of the biggest uh, limitation, biggest binding of civilization, human civilizations, that they don't have the freedom to do what they want. Uh, but the fact remains that we cannot do whatever we think. Of, you know, we do not have the absolute freedom of carrying out whatever we think. So there are certain guidelines, there are certain norms, there are certain society norms. So this is all about the ethics. In this context, I would like to share with you a very small um, experience. Uh, which I had a uh, couple of days back when I was taking an undergraduate course class. Uh, there is always in the middle of the class a uh, few students who, who would create always disturbance, who would create noise and who are perennial problems uh, in smooth running of the class. So uh, when I noticed that they are disturbing the class, I requested them very politely to leave the class uh, because uh, they were disturbing the other students who would like to listen to the lecture. So, uh, I thought that it is a basic right of those sincere students who are sitting in the front bench to listen to the lecture uh, attentively and also it is for the teacher's comfort that he is able to deliver whatever he wants to talk to. But in the middle of that, those few students who are disturbing, that was creating a problem. So, uh, there is uh, a question of basic right. Basic right is that those sincere students who have come to attend to my lectures, they have got the right to listen to the lecture as much as they can. That is the basic right. What was wrong was on those bunch of students who were creating disturbance. So I thought that ethically or morally it is my responsibility to take care of the situation. So I politely request those students to leave the class and uh, eventually they left the class. And this is what is you know my moral conscious, my moral decision. This is what is ethic, what is morally it could be done. And right was a basic right of those sincere students who wanted to listen to my lecture, who wanted to learn to it. And when those students left and they came back to the, at the end of the class with a request to mark their attendance, I thought I gave a second thought and I thought, okay, morally, you know, I, I can't take this liberty of marking their attendance because probably for the next time they will be, you know, careful, they will be able to rectify their behaviors and things. So, you know, throughout my lecture, we will be talking and why I could, why I could exert my power of uh, sort of removing those students or asking those students to go out of the class was because I, I was aware there is an university regulation, university rule that I have the power. Whenever uh, the students are creating disturbance, I can always turn them out outside. So, you know, these set of rules in the society, set of laws in the society, what is right, what is wrong, basic right of the students, you know, sincere students, these terminologies, you know, right or wrong, what is appropriate, what is inappropriate, basic rights, basic rules and regulations, like I told you, the university regulations, these terminologies will be coming, they are all intermingled in a given scenario. In a particular scenario, there is always some element of ethical consideration, there is some element of, you know, rule or legal or, you know, guideline consideration. There is always some, uh, you know, uh, consideration for the human right, what is right, you know, what is their basic right. So, uh, with these few, you know, terminologies to make you comfortable, I will take you to a lecture which have been, you know, has given me the responsibility. So, the three components, you know, small components um, in which I am going to cover within the limited time are, you know, first is the universal declaration of bioethics and human rights, second is the Nuremberg Code. And the third is the beneficence and non maleficence So, I would try my level's best to take you through these small pieces of you know, topics uh, one after one. First, I would like to cover on universal declaration on bioethics and human rights. Okay. Uh, this is you know a kind of uh, declaration you can say which has been framed by UNESCO. Now, what is uh, UNESCO you know uh, before I go to that. Let me uh, first uh, apprise you about certain terminologies like ethic is a philosophical guideline, you know, to uh, decide what is wrong, what is right, you know, what is good, what is bad, 
bioethics is a component of the ethics, is a division, subdivision of the ethics, which deals with the application of ethics in the field of medicine and healthcare. Then declaration, that is a statement that is official and it is expressed, either it is a verbal declaration. In this instance, what we are discussing today, it is a kind of written or printed declaration or printed kind of document. Now universal means it applies to all the people all over the globe, all the nations. So universal declaration of bioethics, universal declaration on bioethics and human rights, which means it is it's something to do with bioethics, it is a declaration, it is a declaration by UNESCO and which is universal, which means it has to be followed or it needs to be followed universally by all the nations, by, by all the people in all the nations throughout the globe. Uh, <clears throat> now, what is the role of UNESCO, you know, why UNESCO has taken the responsibility of forming this guideline. You know, UNESCO is an international organization, the full form is United Nations Educational, Scientific and Cultural Organization. Now, it is an internal organization as I said, it was established in 1946 and November and it has headquarters in Paris. Now, the basic uh, kind of uh, thrust area or basic kind of focus of UNESCO is to deal with education, science and culture because the name as the name says UNESCO means United Nations Scientific, Educational, Scientific and Cultural Organization. Now, uh, that is represented by virtually every country in the globe, 193 countries uh, they are represented. So, whatever declaration is framed, whatever guideline is framed, it is, it is accepted or it is granted that it is with the concurrence of all the member nations that is all 193 uh, countries. Uh, in terms of the language of this declaration, these countries are known as member states. So, time and again I will be referring as the states, states and states. State does not mean the state of Madhya Pradesh here and state of UP and state of Rajasthan. States in their language, states in the language of UNESCO, states in the language of guideline is a member state that means is a country. <clears throat> now, uh, what is this guideline? How, what is the, it is a set, it is a set of, you know, um, it is a set of rules or set of, you know, guidelines or uh, a set of um, directions it has given. Now, uh, normally uh, this set of direction, whatever UNESCO is giving, it is whatever is called as universal declaration on bioethics, they, they do it, they have divided into several, you know, kind of segments, several kind of um, chapters or several kinds of components. Basically, those are known as principles. Like if UNESCO wants that this universal declaration is to be adopted uniformly by all the member countries, they have set down, uh, they have laid down a set of principles. These are the principles. If these are followed by the member countries, automatically the purpose will be served. Automatically the universal declaration formed by UNESCO, supported by or mandated or, or uh, sort of uh, kind of uh, um, supported by 193 member countries will be eventually be implemented. Now, with these principles that UNESCO has set up, these are the principles. Now, they must be having, UNESCO must have had something in their mind that these are the aim, these would be our aim, ultimate aim. That is the reason why they have set up these principles. They have set up as many as 28 principles. But what is the purpose of these principles? These principles are aimed at something. They must be having something in their mind. They must have a set of aims that these aims should be fulfilled. That is why they have prepared those principles. Now, uh, this document was adopted by UNESCO. Uh, that is the 30, 33rd conference. Now, uh, this is they have 28 articles and these articles are various, you know, subdivided into various components. Now, first article is the scope. Now, what is the scope of this particular document? This particular document uh, has, um, first, first article is the scope. Now, what is the scope of this document? That is the first article is all about. The scope of the document is that, you know, this de particular declaration, uh, it is related to medicine, life sciences and associated technologies. Now, this is, this declaration is targeted for human population firstly and when it targets the human population, it is expected that the human population will take care of the legal, social and environmental issues into consideration. They cannot exert 
uh, any guideline or any rule on human being just ignoring these three components. So they have to take care of the social, legal and environmental considerations. Then finally, this universal declaration is sent to the member states, as I said, that the nations. Now, uh, when it is sent to the nations, it is, it is expected that nation would uh, sort of uh, comply or nation should uh, implement these particular guidelines in their own country. Uh, in terms of various organizations, various institutions, various societies, it is expected. So this is what is the scope of this document. The scope of the document is that it is, first of all, uh, it is for the you know declaration pertaining to the ethical issues of uh, medicine, life sciences and associated technologies. This declaration is um, targeted for human being, but it cannot target for only on the medical experiments on the human being. It has to also take into consideration the social, legal and environmental factors also taken into consideration. It is targeted or it is referred to the nations, the member nations. And what was the purpose of referring to the member nation is that the societies, the individuals, the groups within those particular member nations will try to follow this guideline, will try to comply with this guideline. This is the article number one, what is known as scope. Next, uh, now uh, what I have attempted is that this declaration has got a pattern of language, it has got pattern of you know clauses pattern of expressions comma full stop and if every every document my limited experience is that whenever there is a finalization of a document and there are lots and lots of people to uh, keep on suggesting you know something some alterations or other finally one when the document is finalized or approved by in any particular meeting it must have gone through a rigorous process of you know even grammatical editing grammatical corrections so these uh, articles they have a fixed language, they have the actual, they have been expressing some, some form of language which I cannot and I should not violate. Therefore, but at the same time it is also true that if I want to go through line by line of this declaration, every comma full stop, it will take a lot of time for me as well as you to interpret or read in between the lines whatever is mentioned. So in this limited time, unless one sits with one line by another line about 10 minutes, 15 minutes trying to understand about each line, it is very difficult to follow this universal declaration. What I have attempted here, that I have noted down verbatically, word by word, line by line the universal declaration, but at the same time, whenever they are lengthy enough, whenever they are complicated enough, I have tried to symbolize it or try to give the essence of that particular declaration in a pictorial form. So my presentations will first come with the written text of universal declaration, line by line, word by word, whatever is there, comma, full stop wise, without any changes and probably the next slides will be explanation of that particular test, what it wants to say. When I mentioned about the scope in a pictorial manner, try to explain, this is followed by the text of the scope as it is, sentence wise, comma wise, full stop wise, as it is, whatever way it has been stated in the declaration which I don't think anyone can violate or anyone can change. Next, article 2 that deals with aims. Now, uh, there are eight aims which have been given in that particular declaration. I would like to go through one by one. Uh, this is the text. As I said, first I will show you the text, exact text, whatever is there in the, there are four here and then five, six, seven, eight. These are the text, textual form of the aims which have been declared into the universal declaration document. Now, I would like to uh, simplify these. I'll have to run through these aims one by one in a pictorial manner so that it is easier for you to find out what are the various aims there. There are, as I said, there are eight aims. First aim is that guidance. Now, this document, this particular uh, This particular document, you know, it is meant for a purpose of guidance. What kind of guidance, you know, it would guide the states as well as the individual members within those particular states to give some kind of guidance about the principles and policies of this particular uh, document or particular declaration. This is the first aim that is to convey the principles and policies of this universal document and secondly, to make sure or to expect that this document will go to the various individuals or various groups 
who are dealing with this day to day in their practice about the ethical issues. So it's a kind of the guidance given to the states to be utilized by the groups, institutions, communities and members who are responsible for conducting you know, such some kind of you know, clinical experiments, who are responsible for some kind of implementation of this guideline. So this is number aim number one and two. Now aim number three is that promote respect. The aim of this document number three aim is that promotion of it promote it says that promote respect for human dignity and human rights. Uh, <clears throat> Next M4 what M4 says M4 says a dual thing a complementary thing a reciprocal thing M4 says that it does encourage you know medical research uh, it does encourage uh, then it does realize there is a need of scientific research very much true at the same time they also say that these kind of you know these uh, kind of uh, sort of activities pertaining to medical care pertaining to scientific research they have to be within the limits of ethical guidelines they cannot violate the guidelines which means that they cannot violate violate the guidelines and as i said the guideline is guided by the legal consideration, by the environmental consideration, by the cultural consideration, these are some of the bindings of the guideline. Guideline cannot be just free like that. They are bound by such kinds of limitations. So, therefore, that uh, they would encourage uh, medical uh, progress in the medical field. They would encourage freedom of scientific research. At the same time, they are very much conscious or they are very much clear about the declaration. All these activities, all these activities they need to be done within the framework of ethical issues which automatically means that it has to be comply with the social regulations, cultural regulations, human rights and local laws etc. <clears throat> M5 that is encouragement it you know this document aims to encourage a pluralistic kind of interaction regarding this document. Pluralistic means it involves uh, people or sectors from various fields from multiple fields. So pluralistic interaction it encourages. So this fifth aim is it will always encourage that these uh, kind of you know whenever there are ethical issues which are being discussed about they must take into account people from various social sectors, various cultural sectors, various strata of the people, various categories of people. If they are giving any consideration of one particular aspect they should also take into consideration the lawyers, they should also take into consideration the, consideration the local culture they would also take into consideration you know um, the other kind of people you know who, human rights activists and all so they cannot do it alone they have to do they should do it rather taking into consideration apart from the people who are involved in medical treatment or medical sciences and research they should also take into consideration these people from representing from this particular or these various sectors that is what is known as plural, pluralistic interaction <coughs> Then uh, aim number six, it encourages that or it says or rather it recommends that whatever scientific development is you know uh, in the which are coming up which, which develop in the fields of medical, technological and all they should you know first of all everybody should have access to that. It should not be something carried out in a hidden manner in a concealed manner that people do not have any access to whatever what is going on. First, right, first aim is that of the document is that that it should the or rather it, it aims or the declaration says the states that it should have a provision for a very clear cut access of the activities uh, to the various kinds of people. Second thing is that sharing it says that uh, whatever is the development in the field of medical and technologies and scientific research it needs to be shared by all the people. So I am coming back to this particular M number 6. Summarily it says that whatever development is there in scientific field, in medical field, medical treatment or research whatsoever it is or clinical trial whatsoever it is, it has to be accessible, it should be an open document, it cannot be something which is done in a harshish manner, in a concealed manner, is, it, should, it should be accessible to the people, common people or whosoever wants to have it, it has to be an open affair. Second is that sharing that means whatever development supposing there is some progress made 
in some kind of treatment or some vaccine trial or any kind of any many medical research some achievement has been achieved that should be shared by all the communities it is recommended it should be confined only to that particular institution or the individual next is aim is a safeguarding this aim says that it should safeguard and present and future generations obviously we should need to take care of the people around us obviously we need to take care of the ch our children or the next future generation so no ethical guideline um, will all ever think not to have an aim in this particular aspect they will always have an aim that the basically you know the present generation and the future generation they needs to be protected then aim number 8 so that is the conservation of biodiversity that's aim number 8 you should try or we should try for maintaining the biodiversity in this global and you must be aware that it is every now and then every day in our papers people are very much vocal very much conscious to maintain the di di i'm sorry biodiversity so this is a very important point next so we have done with all the eight aims now we are coming to the actual principles what are the actual principles so principles are actually from 3 to 17 which means about uh, 15 of them if i'm not wrong calculation wise so uh, let's go through one by one the principle you know the principles are distributed over various articles those are known as those are numbered as article number 3 to article number 17 so article number 3 to 17 they are covered under principles now article number 3 that is human dignity and human rights it says that human dignity human rights and fundamental freedoms are to be respected this is the article number 3 next is that human uh, article number 3 also says that human dignity and human rights they need to be you know uh, protected how what they say in this particular thing is that the interest of the individual is should be given maximum importance should be given maximum consideration than the science or than the society this particular aspect will be revisited time and again that individual right individuals interest individuals willingness is the utmost important everything is kept aside scientific interest kept aside society requirement kept aside it's the individual who is most important about this so for this ethical consideration is concerned now article number 4 benefit and harm which means that uh <clears throat> any scientific development or anything you know uh, sort of uh, advancement in the field of medical uh, knowledge or medical practice or associated technologies should have a dual kind of consideration while on one hand they should try to maximize the benefit out of this particular research out of this particular medical treatment or medical inter intervention to the participants to the individual who are participating in that particular medical intervention or who are participating in that particular research so it should that should be maximized as much as possible the benefit should be maximized at the same time it is also true that it is a requirement and one has to be careful that the harm caused to that particular individual is minimized so this particular declaration that is article number 4 it has a, a do dual kind of things merged together benefit and harm benefit maximum benefit for those individuals who are involved in the particular medical research who are involved you know in particular that technology and um, at the same time it is also true that one has to take care that the individual the individual is not harmed at all or the harm to the individual should be minimized this is article number 4 now uh, article 5 is autonomy and individual responsibility that means we must ensure autonomy of the person whosoever is participating into that you know who's to, who whoever is a subject of medical treatment or whosoever is a participant of the medical research his autonomy has to be maintained first and foremost he should have an autonomous kind of a de uh, decisions to make so he has to be given maximum autonomy about it in case of any situation where the person is not able to exert his autonomy i am going to discuss with you share with you some of the situations where the individual is not able to share or express his autonomy then we must have some kind of alternate possibly legal you know options or legal arrangements so that we make sure that his autonomy is not compromised <coughs> then article 6 is the consent so uh, it says that any 
preventive uh, diagnostic and therapeutic medical intervention is to be carried out with the prior consent of the individual. Now, not only prior consent, free prior consent which means prior prior it has to be free and it has to be well informed consent like the whatever whenever we are going to seek for the consent the person should be given adequate information adequate you know details about what what we are intending to do so firstly it has to be a, a kind of you know uh, prior because we cannot uh, finish some kind of experimentation and then go take his permission permission has to be taken obviously logically before before whatever we do so it is a prior free free means i think those people who are in the uh, legal profession they will know even those uh, will and all which our parents made for us they did not have any kind of um, they, their their legal validity uh, were challenged time and again because uh, if if supposing i had a sibling sister and uh, there was a property which my mother had made an, a will uh, in my favor and it was registered will in the court yet court court the legal people they have always a kind of uh, rethinking whether this particular will was executed in a free mind or maybe my mother was you know inebriated my mother was under some drugs mother was you know forced to make something so they said nothing doing this will okay this will is, uh, is a valid will this has been it's a registered will in the court of law but you have to take the permission from your sister you know legal sister so uh, what is known as probate i think i'm sure the legal people from law profession will know all i wanted to tell you is that the consent has to be it has to be prior not only prior it has to be a free consent i mean there should not be any kind of outside influence on the person to or any kind of compulsion that he doesn't feel free to give the consent or not the basic purpose of consent is lost third is that informed consent i mean the consent cannot be just two lines or one line you need to inform the person that this is all what what we are planning to do and this information better if it is a written information you know it has to be expressed express means it cannot be a symbolic kind of thing you just ask him do you agree to it he says he nods his head and he says yes no that doesn't serve the purpose it has to be expressed it cannot be expressed in a symbolic manner it cannot be expressed in and uh, in, in terms of um, you know expression of human you know nodding the head or etc it has to be a written kind of documented expression and the document of consent should have a provision that the person can withdraw his consent or withdraw his verdict or withdraw his opinion about this particular medical intervention or whatever procedure is going to be done he is free to withdraw it at any point of time so these are some of the key components of the you know uh, uh, taking the con consent form now uh, this is pertaining to the preventive diagnostic and therapeutic medical intervention uh, same holds true for the scientific research basically the things are absolutely similar informed consent which has to be prior which has to be free which has to be expressed in written form and the, the person should have the freedom to withdraw it at any point of time now with this thing i have just tried to, you know and i'm sorry before that uh, one more point in case the research or any kind of medical treatment or whatsoever intervention study is going to be carried out in a community then it is better that we must take we should take the consent of the community leader but at the end of the day the community leader does not substitute the consent of the individual just because some something is being done in the community that does not mean the individual is ignored so in case of a community research or community based work it is appropriate to have the consent of the community leader true but that does not substitute the consent of the individual now uh, this is about summarily you know about the consent as i said that it has to be free it has to be uh, a prior consent it has to be expressed it should be adequately informative it should contain have the provision of withdrawal and in case of community the community leader uh, leader should be involved in the consent process his consent should also be taken but as i said as i emphasize reemphasize that this community leader's consent does not replace the individual consent now uh, there are situations when consent is not possible to take there are situations when it is difficult to have a consent 
what are those particular situations uh, if we can think of a little bit about some of the situations where it is difficult to obtain the consent of the of the person concerned supposing there is a road accident victim who is lying unconscious now you want to take him to the hospital and if you want to start the treatment of that particular individual um, he is unconscious and the doctor knows that until uh, some immediate treatment is uh, you know started the person may collapse and person may die what is the scope of taking consent because the person is lying unconscious so these are some of the situations or emergency situations in health sciences let me quote you because i belong to that profession so i know about this you must be knowing many other example i'm sure i have just quoted one example from the medical side or the health side that when the person is unconscious on a road accident there is no point no no issue of consent everything we cannot wait for the consent so this is one situation when taking the consent or consent um, you know a kind of uh, requirement of the consent can be waived off next uh, there are other categories other situations where the consent probably is a difficult proposition for instance in a child he sh sh the child who is 2 year old he or she cannot the child cannot give any consent because it's uh, not grown up to that level he grow, he, does, he or she doesn't grown up to that level to exert his or her autonomy which was which was there in the aim so uh, in this particular situation when we are dealing with the child the consent is in doubt because so we cannot take the consent from the child the other group you know where the consent is a difficult thing is mentally uh, impaired persons which means persons who are you know in uh, mental asylum who are mentally uh, deranged or Uh, rather put, let me put it in other ways. Uh, differently abled, rather, I think that's 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 what the terminology is. They are also, uh, you know, in a difficult position to give any consent because they, whatever, even if they give their consent, it will not be guided by appropriate um, mental thinking or appropriate mental decisions. So these are the three situations which I thought would be appropriate to quote. First is the roadside victims. There is no point in taking consent because there is because it will it will be at the expense of the life of the person. and two categories of individuals in our society where also the consent uh, procurement or obtaining the consent is a difficult proposition that's one is a child and second is the differently able people because they are also are they are in a mental state to give the consent now now what what is to be done about the people who are you know uh, who do not have the capacity of uh, giving consent Um, as i mentioned some of the situation what could be done does that mean that some experiment cannot be done some medical research cannot be done uh, so in that instance you know whether it's a medical intervention or it's a kind of research there are certain broad guidelines i would like to talk first tell you uh, the guidelines you know there are three basic prerequisites number one that whatever is done it is done as per the domestic law it does not violate the domestic law second thing is that it has the consent can be taken by legally authorized representative or we call it lar third prerequisition is that we can only take up research in this particular group of people like ch children like the differently able individuals we can only take up research if that particular research cannot be taken to a comparable group of individuals with normal mental state who can give author authorization or who can give consent in a in a stable mind manner so these are the three prerequisites for carrying out research in those particular populations where the consent is a difficult proposition or consent cannot be obtained first of all it has to be guided it should abide by the local law domestic law second thing is that the consent can only be uh, given on their behalf by legally you know approved representatives or lar legally authorized representative or lar third is that only thing only condition when this research can be taken up in this particular population is that you do not have a comparable population or you cannot carry out the research in a comparable population uh, with normal mental state let's see one by one uh, for instance first is the domestic law uh, in india we have you know many domestic laws to safeguard the interest or dignity or the autonomy of the children for instance children act 1960 Uh, it it does protect it is a lots and lots of legal provisions to protect the rights of the children which also includes clauses related to health and medical treatment and medical research then persons with disabilities act 2016 this is another legal provision which also takes care of the dignity autonomy 
and the rights, the human rights of those individuals who are, you know, um, differently abled. So, uh, whatever research is being done, it has to abide by the domestic laws. This is the first requirement. Second requirement is that, as I said, legally authorized representatives. Who, who could be the legally authorized representative? It could be spouse, uh, it could be, uh, sorry, it could be a spouse, it could be a legal guardian. Uh, in case of supposing the parents, uh, mother is uh, not there, father is only there and vice versa, he or she could be the legal guardian. And third is the power of attorney. In case of non-availability of spouse or legal gu guardian, there can be situation when consent can be taken from a legally appointed author attorneys. So, consent can be taken from this particular handicapped group of individuals, uh, provided as I said that it abides, it does not violate the domestic law or domestic regulation. Secondly, this consent is executed by legally authorized persons and I have given you the examples of three legalized authorized examples that is the spouse, the legal guardians and the power of attorney. <coughs> now, here is the situation. If you uh, recall, I had mentioned there is a third clause that that particular research cannot be taken up in a parallel group of individuals, healthy individuals uh, or the mentally stable individuals. Only then it can be uh, applicable to those, you know, uh, those particular select group of a population that is, um, uh, you know, uh, differently able populations. Now, most of many situations it does happen that that particular research can very well be taken up in healthy population. Now, in that instance, you don't, one does not have the basic right to carry out this particular research or this particular medical intervention in those particular group of people who are mentally not stable or children because we have an option to carry out these research interventions or these studies in a parallel populations who are healthy children or who are healthy adults. There are situations, there are situations when it is not so. For instance, a clinical condition which is known as Down syndrome, it is a congenital abnormality. The individuals who are suffering from Down syndrome very quickly, you know, they tend to develop Alzheimer's disease or which is characterized by loss of memories or um, you know dementia what we call it in medical terms loss of memory or dementia so uh, the people who are suffering from uh, down syndrome they tend to develop dementia they tend to develop alzheimer's disease faster compared to the healthier population now the antipsychotic drugs which are meant for promoting the power of memory or which are anti dementia drug let me tell you they have different dual you know uh, different kind of actions when it is in the healthy individuals when it is the individuals or the group of individuals in Down syndrome. So, we cannot help it, we cannot carry out these anti-dementia drugs. Um, uh, we, we cannot say that we can, um, we can do it only in the healthy population because they are going to show the comparable results. No, because anti-dementia drugs, they do show a different kind of response when carried out in the people with Down syndrome and when carried out in normal healthy individuals. Therefore, this is one situation where uh, the, it can be compromised provided by that there is no alternative to carry out this particular research in healthy individual. <clears throat> now, respect for human vulnerability and personal integrity. You know, elderly people, homeless people, shelterless people, slum dwellers, you know, we must respect uh, also their you know, personal integrity. Vulnerable population like old generations people, very old people, homeless people, uh, we cannot take care, grab them and force them into the ethical research or is some kind of scientific research without giving ethical consideration. So, this, this clause says, this article says respect for human vulnerability and personal integrity. Then privacy and confidentiality. Privacy means you need, must give some kind of private, you know, you cannot carry out examination of the females in the open corridor. You need to have a separate, you know, why we put a curtain around, why we take the, sorry, to take the female into a room separate room for questioning or examination because it is a question of privacy of the woman. Similarly, for those people who are suffering from HIV, they are socially embarrassed and as such, they are socially oppressed and they are attacked day in and day out by the society because of their you know, stigma of their disease. So, when one wants to interview or takes the consent of undertaking some kind of research work or some kind of work, some kind of investigation in an HIV infected individuals is very much you know uh, essential that he, he is taken you know in a place isolated place where the confidentiality is mentioned ma maintained uh, privacy is mentioned rather confidentiality means confidentiality of the document whatever you know uh, 
you know information that we are collecting from that particular individual has to be kept confidential it has to be you know kept secured and confidential not only that it also says this particular also says that this particular information or this particular information whichever is collected from that particular in individual should not be shared or should not be utilized for any other kind of investigation so privacy and confidentiality means privacy of the person whosoever is participating in the research wherever it, even if we are starting taking the information from there up to the final medical intervention we must maintain the final examination final intervention must maintain confidentiality uh, sorry privacy and second is the confidentiality of the document or the information whatever confirmation uh, uh, information we have collected from that particular individual has to be kept confidential and it should not be shared with people even that particular information should not be utilized for any other purpose other than for primary purpose for which the information has been sought for now equality justice and equity means uh, all the individuals should be treated with uh, equal as equal it it is it is a basic requirement of the human right that all persons are individual we should not treat differently the people you know like people suffering from hiv aids we should not treat them as the anti social or socially outcast kind of people they do have the you know uh, kind of right for investigations right from entry to the admi admit you know sort of um, uh, right for admission to the hospitals if necessary all those basic rights of the human being it should not be different for the people who are uh, it should be different uh, shouldn't be different or it should be uniform for all the individuals in the society across then article 11 is non discrimination and non stigmatization non discrimination means the person should not be discriminated uh, by people by some reason or other and uh, second is that you know uh, stigmatization let me tell you share you something very small incident you know when i was working in hiv lab hiv aids lab at national center for disease control i was looking after uh, the thalassemic children you know who got hiv infection through blood transfusion uh, uh, oil, you will all admit those poor thalassemic children who got hiv infection through blood transfusion they, it is not their fault it is it is that they 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 didn't have access to adequate healthy voluntary blood donation so they had to rely on the professional or remunerated blood donor donors with very much unhygienic practice and these donors used to visit to red light areas every now and then they picked up their hiv infection and the infection is transmitted from their blood to these children now they are innocent in any case you will all agree to it that these thalassemic children who are hiv infected they are um, you know uh, basically poor unfortunate children infected with hiv just because none of their fault it is a fault of faulty blood transfusion it's a fault of the society now when i used to share with the parents of these children i used to be shocked to listen to certain aspects they used to tell that in the school they are made to sit separately i am telling you the story in 1992 to 93 now we are in 2018 so it's uh, how many years back so seven to about 25 years back 25 years back the situation used to be like it has must have improved now but i do not know to what extent it has been improved but what the story they used to say in the school the, their you know friend, their intimate friends would like to sit away from them we like to keep a distance even the teachers would try to you know a sort of segregate him from the rest of the children in a in a in a subtle manner in a, a sort of not in a very obvious manner but from little indirectly or some reason somehow or other the child will be made to feel that he has been isolated from there the they he the child's peer friends in the society who used to play with him day in and day out they would not like to you know uh, play with him any more because of fear of hiv infections this is a kind of you know glare and blatant stigmatization which i have come across in my life or limited working experience in it in the field of hiv aids i have never come across i used to feel really uh, moved i used to feel touched i used to feel uh, really really very sorry about these children because uh, it was a kind of uh, their death before their actual physical death because they were outcast and by the society they are stigmatized they are stigmatized in the educational institution that means in the school they are stigmatized in the society no one would the children would not like to play with them so this is what is stigmatization and this is something which has to be condemned thoroughly in and out <coughs> then respect for culture diversity and pluralism 
as I said in the beginning that, well, uh, you know, there should be some kind of uh, respect for the cultural diversity, no doubt about it. India is a country of varied cultures. There are many, many cultures across. So we must respect the local culture before we conduct any scientific research or before we con conduct any medical kind of trial or medical you know, intervention. We must take care of the local culture. We do not have basic right to disregard their cultures. It is well understood. But at the same time, it is also true that such cultural practice should not create some kind of situation or should not a uh, kind of encroach or should not make a, a kind of situation where it is going against the medical ethics, against the medical norm. Like for instance, even in the villages, people used to believe that home delivery is safer than the institutional delivery of the childbirth. Even now, uh, if you go into the remote, remote villages, you will find that local dyes, you know, with unsterile knives and other things. They, they are preferred, they are called by the people for home delivery of the child that they would think that this is a safer option, this is a much better option rather than sending that particular female to a hospital. This is something, something which is culturally, you know, it's a kind of cultural, uh, it's a dark spot in our culture. So there is, we, should, we shouldn't, you know, a kind of way it is said that although we must respect the culture, that does not mean that the culture will have something which is against the, you know, uh, kind of medical ethics or which is uh, against the medical norms. <clears throat> I'll give you other examples, you know. Until recently, uh, disclosure of a female about her menstrual hygiene or the periods used to be a social stigma. If a female talks about her menstrual irregularity in the OPD or in the public, even within the house or in the family, they everybody used to, you know, sort of uh, kind of glare at her that how dare she is discussing about her menstrual cycles and uh, the menstrual hygiene and menstrual problems, how she is going to the doctor with these kinds of problems, this is a social stigma. I mean, we are yet to get over over this situation, but I think of late there has been a uh, substantial, you know, kind of consciousness among the people to uh, kind of promote, you know, that uh, the well menstrual hygiene should be talked about, should be taken care of and, and females should not have inhibited any kind of social inhibition to disclose their problems regarding menstrual hygiene. Uh, similarly, you know, I think there was a film Padman, uh, if I am not wrong, if I am not confusing, which, you know, we try to promote this concept. Then is that stop prenatal sex determination, you all know that is very much rampant, even now it is rampant, desire for a male child. So, pre, you know, there was an act, uh, there was an act, uh, I am not able to quote over here, there has been a law passed that pre, long back, of course, it is an old story, but I am saying is that a decade back, it used to be a very common practice. So, it is a cultural thing, in the culture it is there inside their mind, that male child is, you know, is more useful for the society, females are useless, females are, you know, a kind of burden on the society, that used to be a culture. But when we said that we must respect the cultural diversity, it also says that cultural diversity should not uh, kind of encroach on the basic right of the individual or basic health right of the human being. <coughs> Solidarity and cooperation, uh, we, we should try to uh, encourage, you know, solidarity and cooperation, you know, um, within the people in the society. And then social responsibility and health, whatever experiments, human experiments, whatever medical intervention, whatever is, is being done medical research, whatever, it should be aiming ultimately into the promotion of social responsibility and health. Now, how this could be done? Now, this is the text, as I said, that I will be mentioning the text uh, and also give you some kind of justification or gist of the or the essence of that particular text. It is not possible to go through the text line by line, but I can, all I can do is that I can, uh, this is the actual text of this article 14, which deals with the social responsibility and health. Now, what in essence it says? is that, you know, it means that it should have access to healthcare, access to nutrition and water, improvement of living condition, elimination of marginalization, poverty, illiteration reduction, these are the some of the things. So, when we are talking about the, uh, you know, social, resp uh, talking about ethics, medical intervention, medical research towards the promotion of social uh, kind of uh, social status in the society, we cannot do it without doing, these are the ways and means by which this can be promoted. Then uh, sharing of benefits, this is the text as I mentioned that this is the mentioning over the text about the sharing of the benefit. Now, what it essentially means sharing of benefit, it means that whatever scientific research is being carried out, whatever result it comes 
if you recall right in the beginning I had mentioned about the sharing the data has to be shared this was one of the you know important aim that whatever scientific achievement whatever results whatever progress is made it must be shared within the community it cannot be a some kind of hidden kind of thing so uh, now how 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 a scientific achievement or how a scientific finding how a some kind of observation can be shared it can be shared in many ways it can be shared you know uh, for instance uh, it can be shared you know uh, giving the access to the healthcare uh, some new diagnostic and therapeutic modalities and care can be shared uh, support support for the health services the you know the whatever be the observation whatever the finding can provide support with the health services and then access to technological knowledge capacity building and other forms of benefit uh, even those those people who have participated in that particular research if due recognition is given about them in the form of some kind of documentation these are the individuals who have participated in this particular research so they should be given maximum benefit and these kind of individuals can be given some kind of benefit say um, uh, say for instance uh, some kind of benefit say free treatment lifelong treatment for their whole family this could be one of the way the benefit can be shared but for the sake of benefit for the sake of you know um, benefit or the sharing of the scientific research one should not indulge into any activity which is improper that that activity should not be undertaken even if it is for it is for the benefit of the society for instance you know in india uh, it's a it's a virgin ground for doing undertaking undertaking some kind of trials which people cannot take in developed worlds because there are people who are poor there are people who are you know homeless there are people who are slum dwellers they are poor so uh, a kind of research is very very easy to carry out you know unethically even in india which cannot be carried out ethically abroad so benefit of research does not mean that this benefit will be at the expense of exploitation of some category of people you know who are marginalized who are poor so this is an improper inducement for participation in the research that is not recommended then protecting the future generation we should try to make all attempts to protect our future generation and then protection of the environment biosphere and biodiversity which means that as i had mentioned that we try to uh, sort of protect the biodiversity the varieties of life existing on the earth we should try to protect the environment these are the some of the issues and then uh, as i said that this is over from article 3 to article 17 these are the uh, 15 principles which are targeted uh for uh, you know for implementation of this universal declaration on bioethics and then there are some application of principles then articles 18 to articles 21 they deal with the application of the principles which means how these principles can be applied the principles they have framed principles from article number 3 to article number 17 they have laid down the principles now article number 18 to 21 it deals that how these principles can be implemented within the state in that they have article 18 decision making and address addressing the bioethical issues ethical formation of ethical committee risk management assessment and trans transnational practices these are the four articles you know 18 19 20 and 21 which deal with that how how these principles can be you know applied how these principles whatever principles have been just now talked about how they can be applied in the nations or the member nations this is the text i will not go through the text uh this is you know uh, this is a gist of uh, article 18 that is addressing decision making and addressing the bioethical issues it shows it says that professionalism honesty integrity and transparency in decision making to be promoted there is a spelling so editorial error kindly bear with me to be promoted periodic review of the bioethical issues and persons and professionals concerned in the society as a whole should be engaged in dialogue on a regular basis and pluralistic dialogue all i wanted to tell you is that decision making and addressing the bioethical issues should be done with professionalism with honesty with integrity and it should be reviewed time and again and it should be reviewed in the ethical committee which is formed in the nation in the, the particular society and it should be open to public debate or uh, public you know opinions from all sectors of the uh, society now ethics committee as i said that any bioethical issue has to pass through the ethical committee 
in our uh, in the faculty of medical and health sciences at SGT University we have recently formed an ethical committee now what is an ethical committee now ethical committee as I said I had been mentioning time and again about one particular word that is pluralistic approach pluralistic approach means it should rep be represented by the people whatever we are discussing whatever decisions we are taking it should be pluralistic pluralistic means it should involve people from all spheres so uh, similarly in the ethical committee that we have at SGT University in Faculty of Medical and Health Sciences, we do have lawyers, we do have a social scientist. Okay. So this, you know, ethical committee is composed of, it's a pluralistic in nature, it is <coughs> composed of um, a kind of uh, representative from legal sector, it is, it is represented by a social scientist, represented by a female scientific worker, female scientist, as well as other people, a common person, community representative, so it is pluralistic. This particular ethical committee's responsibility is to meet time and again, take the decisions and uh, these are the respons basic responsibilities of the ethic committee. Review all the you know, scientific proposals which are coming, some provide some kind of guidance to the different institutions, how they should work all about and uh, you know, so, sort of create some kind of public awareness in the society. These are some of the basic you know, uh, kind of uh, responsibilities of the ethical committee. Now article 20 is risk management and risk assessment. That means any scientific intervention, any scientific research should take into consideration the genetic and environmental research associated. Supposing you give approval to a, a kind of experimentation which involves uh, a kind of radioactive materials. Now it is an environmental hazard if, if there is not sufficient containment about the radioactive material. If it is spread, you know the, about the Chernobyl experiment, the Chernobyl disaster in uh, Soviet Union of Russia because the radioactive material spilled out of the you know, setup and it caused lots and lots of human hazards. So therefore, this is something which is a serious concern. They created some genetic you know, abnormalities among the individuals. So this is a typical example. So we should not uh, kind of um, blindly approve or we must take into consideration the ethical consideration about conducting a research which has a potential for the environmental and genetic risk. So therefore, any research proposal, any research study should take a proper assessment about these kind of you know risk management and uh, uh, risk assessment. First, they should assess the risk and they should also find out the strategies of the management. Transnational practices, I will go into the uh, gist of the thing, the crux of the thing. It is a transnational practice means across the nations. Now, what all things? Whenever there is an involvement of more than uh, you know one nation, multinational, that is what is known. That is why it is known as transnational. There are certain things which has to be kept in mind. First and foremost is the need of the host country. Now it has to be you know it has to take into consideration the need of the host country. Second is that globalization problem, like uh, you know glo global health problem. I'm sorry. It must take into consideration some problem which is globally you know evident. Third is that. You know, equal participation. Whenever there is a participation of more than one nation, the participation has to be ethically. The participation has to be equal. It cannot be exploitation of one nation at the expense of other nations. What is not permitted in such transnational kind of research activities is ethically not permitted. Basically, you know, it should not uh, kind of indulge or encourage bioterrorism. It should not encourage into illegal organ trade. So these are some of the two things which one must be. Uh, cautious, ethically cautious before some transnational or some you know some collaborative study which are taken up scientific study. I will not go into the promotion of the declarations, it, it has got something to do how we can how the this particular declaration can be promoted in the state, in between the states. Final provisions are articles 26 to 28. UNESCO finally provision means finally wants to say that this in entire document you know you must have noticed that uh, time and again this human rights uh, this uh, law and this um, uh, consent and these things have come time and again you know in various clauses or other there has been a lot of lot of repetition so what unesco says finally in the final say that this uh, entire thing document has to be viewed in totality it cannot be in an isolated manner you know every document every article has got some link or other with the next article or the, some other article so it has to be viewed in terms of interrelationship and complementary secondly if there there is some kind of limitation or some 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 clause is going to, com to be compromised out of this particular document out of this particular thing it has to be you know uh, some kind of you know uh, 
there has to be some pre definite evidence preconditions about violating this particular thing it could be a legal it could be a local reason whatsoever it is so normally it is not permitted to deviate from this particular declaration the articles but if it is there is deviation it has to be having a substantial reason for de such deviation and third is that this declaration should not, i do not know why why this what this mean because sufficiently educated or reasonably educated people will try will not try to misinterpret the guidelines but even then unesco finally says that this should not be misinterpreted in terms of to violate the human rights fundamental freedoms of and human dignity um, maybe to be on the safe side to be on the safeguard they have said this so uh, with this i finish the first portion of my talk that is universal declaration on bioethics and human rights next is a nuremberg code we are aware um, all aware about the second world war now this new one nuremberg code has got something to do with the second world war now before second world war certain laws used to be existent in germany uh, like for instance uh, that time when when germany had a longer territory they were they had lots and lots of countries also amalgamated with them it used to be called as prussia in short prussia means the old pre world war 1 germany which they, which there were lots and lots of you know uh, the germany was much larger in size that time you know there used to be some kind of laws for instance uh, people used to have a controversy about uh, you know about the eth ethics of human experimentation which used to be carried out you know every the now and then rampantly at that particular point of time as a result of which there was first prussian directive of informed consent in 1891 that is before world war 1 so this you know uh, prussian prime minister issued a circular that the treatment of tuberculosis by tuberculin in the prisoners can only be carried out with their consent this was the first evident of some kind of ethical directive in the pre world war era in the prussian region prussian era what is known as the prussian um, directive on informed consent in the year 1891 then the nizer's case you know nizer was a scientist who discovered gonococcus now he what he used to do he used to take the serum from normal not normal from the people who are not suffering from syphilis some some other medical conditions he used to take blood or serum uh, from that those individuals and inject into the people who are suffering from syphilis with the hope that they may be cured that particular time of time which was eventually found out to be unethical i mean the nizer being such an eminent scientist never bothered he used to collect the blood or serum from the individuals who are admitted for some other condition maybe malaria leprosy whatever it is take the serum and inject in those people who are suffering from syphilis with the hope the syphilis may be you know cured that was finally you know a sort of contested by different batch of people he was penalized and ultimately you know he was uh, kind of um, some kind of you know um, punishment was given by the disciplinary court now this was another evidence during the pre world world war then binding code it was formed in 1900 this also had few of the ethical considerations like no harmful experimentation on human being requirement of unambiguous informed consent with explanation of the negative consequences no medical intervention other than diagnosis healing and immunization permitted in children or any other persons to, who are not competent to give consent all i wanted to tell you that these codes were existent before world war 2 even in germany Uh, then uh, in uh, 1931 there was guideline form for human experimentations even that guide particular guideline also had the key elements of the you know beneficence and non maleficence which is going to discuss informed consent waiving of informed consent experimental research on human consent is must and clear cut documentation of clinical trials these issues which we discussed in the universal declaration of bioethics had been touched upon had been considered you know time and again in the germany so the pre world war germany now i am coming to what happened in world war 2 this was the worst of the human uh, kind of suffering people the human mankind has experienced you all know that despite having existed all, all these regulations which i discussed berlin code and uh, prussian declarations all these things it, they were all totally ignored and the whatever the nazi government whatever they had done was definitely something which cannot be thought in terms of a normal humanity it's a shocking kind of incidents the german physicians they planned and enacted euthanasia program that that means the systematic killing of those who deemed unworthy of life 
the victims were mostly the mentally retarded mentally re ill and the physically impaired the german used to think that those those individuals who are not worthy for the society they must be executed they must be finished so they, systematically they kept on killing those individuals which they thought they're not physically competent not or mentally competent they used to think them as animals and they think used to think that they are not useful for the societies they must be executed now uh, they the german uh, physicians or the german scientists they conducted a horrible kind of experiments with these you know prisoners of war like extremes exposing them to extremes of cold exposing them to electrical shocks no ethical consideration at all they used to be treated as animals and you know um, many of them they would, they would die because of this particular torture they would be you know a kind of uh, lifelong they will be incapacitated so they these hundreds of people hundreds and thousands of people mostly coming from you know poland uh, mostly the, from russia from jews they were subjected to this some kind of unethical human experimentations which in the modern day civilized society you cannot think of they were treated just like animals many of them they died and these were not one two or three or thousand there were hundreds and thousands now uh, december 9 1946 when the world war ended then the treaty forces the americans basically they took the initiative to put these individuals these you know are kind of guilty or these um, guilty physicians or the people who are responsible for this kind of you know inhuman kind of experimentations inhuman kind of activities unethical activities should be tried in the court so which was known as doctors trial or the medical trial or officially it was designated as united states of america versus karl brand now it was held in the palace of justice in nuremberg germany that's why it is known as nuremberg court ultimately you know what happened is that 22 men and one woman mostly they were doctors including some of the eminent physicians they were convicted and what was the the kind of uh, charge against them murders tortures and carrying out unethical and unscientific experiments ultimately uh, in the court there were very few survivors out of this torture who could come to the court there were some 85 witnesses and some more than little more than 1400 documents which were produced in the particular court judgment was pronounced on august 19 1947 the sentencing was done the very next day and what was the judgment what was the sentence out of the 23 defendants seven sentenced to death by hanging nine given prior uh, sort of prison term life term and seven were not found to be guilty this was the verdict given ultimately <clears throat> now at that particular time when this court judgment was going on there are certain people sitting over there they thought it is wise to put down certain kind of rules and regulations which is now known as nuremberg code so this is the genesis of the nuremberg code there have been films on nuremberg code there has been there are novels i do not know many of you might have read the novel nuremberg code this is the long and short history about the nuremberg code now this nuremberg code had basically 10 10 clauses into it 10 clauses many of the clauses which are marked in the pink color you know they were which are, these are were i have discussed at the time of um, this i have discussed at the time time when i was discussing the universal declaration of bioethics so some of the which are there marked in the pink color they are common there is nothing new some of the clauses in that nuremberg code there is something unique about the nuremberg code which does not feature in the universal declaration on bioethics these are what are these that is the experiments uh, should produce should are expected to produce fruitful results and then um, then uh, kind of uh, quali- it has to be only carried out by qualified investigators there should be terminator of termination of studies whenever there is some inadvertent outcome is you know experienced or suspected and there in there is uh, what is this clause something unique is that uh, okay the experiment has to be based on prior knowledge based on the experimentation results in the animals as well as some kind of you know um, studying the natural course of the disease some of the clauses of nuremberg code are unique to nuremberg code but many of the things like informed consent voluntary consent you know like um, injury should be minimal to the person participating in that particular research protection against risk freedom from withdraw these are the things which you have already discussed time and again they were very much common they were taken into consideration in the universal declaration of uh, bioethics then we are coming to the two terms beneficence and non-maleficence these are the two uh, terms which are time and again which are used 
by the people who are dealing with the ethics. <clears throat> now, in the principle of ethics, there are four, four broad components that is autonomy, beneficence, non maleficence, and social justice. So, beneficence and non maleficence, non, non -maleficence this, they too comprise or they are compo two components of the four components which are included into the principles of bioethics. Now, uh, what, what actually beneficence means? Doing good to others. What does non maleficence do? Not doing harm to anybody. At this moment, you might be perplexed to think that it is automatically means the same thing because, on one hand, you are saying doing good for others, at the same time, you are saying that not to do any harm. I, I logically, if outside this context, if I, as a layman is asked, tell me any difference between these two, he will not be able to say. He will automatically say that if I do not want to do any harm, automatically it means that I am doing good to the person. Anyway, so these are the two clauses which are used. First, you know, let me give you some examples of beneficence. For instance, rescuing a drowning person, uh, provided vaccination in the general population for protection of the impending epidemic of a disease, advising a smoker for quitting the smoking. These are some of the things you are doing good to the persons. So, it is known as beneficence. What is <clears throat> non maleficence? That not doing any harm to the person, not giving a person a harmful drug, refraining from saying harmful things to the person. So, uh, given a choice, some people say that we must give more importance to these particular things. First and foremost, even hypocrite's oath, if we go through, the first line of hypocrite oath says that do no harm to the person. So, they do not um, equate it that doing good to the person is as good, you know, equivalent to not doing harm, you know. So, first clause is do not do any harm and then do good for others. <clears throat> now, in terms of medical practice, the medical practitioners, they face a tremendous dilemma. I do not recall or I, I think it is very difficult to think of a situation when you are planning to do some good for the patients without minimal risk or minimal harm to the per person. You want to give an emergency injection to save him from some, from some kind of an impending coma or you want to give some kind of injections to prevent you know the cardiac arrest. Well, that means that you have given some injections, you have done some, some kind of painful you know kind of thing, uh, uh, some, you have inflicted some pain to the person. So, every uh, in when it comes to medical science, every medical intervention, every medical decision for doing harm to the person is automatically you know intermingled or automatically tied with doing some minimal amount of harm. It is a very difficult proposition to think of a situation where you are doing medically. Um, for the benefit of the person totally without any risk or without any harm to the person. It is a very difficult situation. So, that is why it is uh, called that um, it is a both sides of the coin. Uh, so, concept of beneficence and malef maleficence as an individual, as a person, as a medical person, I personally find it very difficult to you know keep them, compartmentalize them, to separate them. I whichever you know situations I try to think a lot uh, possibly you can also exert your uh, you know a kind of exercise or you can think a lot there can there be any situation when there is a total beneficence for the patients with a, without any malfeasance uh, if you can think of a situation I will be very much thankful if you can forward it to me I will try to keep it in my record till now uh, my limited studies and my limited experience in the medical field I have not been able to think of any situation when there is total beneficence, there is no non beneficence. So, I consider it there both the sides of the coin. With this, I thank you very much for patience hearing and I hope that uh, uh, the dilemma will persist in your life, what is to be done, what is not to be done, better said you know than done. And I think one of the very difficult situation in day to day's life, everybody's life to decide in any particular situation what is right and what is wrong. And if one wants to go through or one wants to abide totally by what is right and what is wrong, it is very difficult to survive. With these few words, I thank you so much for patience hearing. Thank you very much.